Starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, I'm Sarah Carr. I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem-Based Management Tools Network, or EBM Tools Network for short, and we're very glad you could be with us today. Um, and I wanted to let you know before we get started, this webinar is also co-sponsored by OpenChannels.org. Um, so we're very excited today. The presentation is going to be about educating the public about climate change threats using role play simulations, and it's going to be focused on the New England Climate Adaptation Project. And we're very excited to have Carrie Hewlett from the Consensus Building, Building Institute, uh, Steve Miller from the Great Bay Near, and Tana Marie Surgeon Rogers from the Wakoit Bay Near with us to talk about the project. Um, one thing before we get started, uh, we very much want you guys to um, be able to ask questions of the presenters, and we're going to have plenty of time um, at the end of the formal presentation for uh, question and answer. There's two ways you can ask questions. You can raise your virtual hand and be unmuted. Um, it's a little hand icon in your user interface. Um, this only works if, if you're on the telephone, if you've entered your PIN number, or if you're on using your computer um, audio if you have a working microphone. Um, and we'll save questions like that for the, the question and answer period. But throughout the presentation and as well as during the, the question and answer period, uh, you can also type questions into the question panel of the interface. And then um, I'll moderate the question and answer with the presenters at the end. If there's any clarifying questions, I might uh, ask them the quest clarifying question uh, during the pre formal presentation. But um, uh, more substantive questions will hold to the end. So again, thank you uh, for being here, and um, we're, I'm going to turn it over to Carrie to get started. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Well, uh, thanks everyone for coming. We're excited to talk about this. As Sarah mentioned, my name is Carrie Hewlett. I'm with a group out of Cambridge, Massachusetts called the Consensus Building Institute. And I just want to go through um, the partners that work together on this project so you're aware of who came together. My organization, as I mentioned, is a, is a private nonprofit organization. We work on helping people, uh, multiple stakeholders on a variety of public issues come together and make decisions. We had MIT's Science Impact Collaborative work with us and did a lot of the work, particularly the research. We had several research um, assistants working on the project, and I was actually at MIT as a grad student uh, when I started on this project and then uh, actually started working full-time for CBI and continued in a different capacity. Another partner is the National Estuary and Research Reserve System. We have four uh, different sites partner on this project, and Tana Marie uh, is in the site in Massachusetts at the Wakoi Bay, and Steve is in, at the site in New Hampshire uh, at the Great Bay Reserve. And, uh, and then the whole project was uh, funded by the Neuroscience Collaborative, which is um, funding that comes through NOAA. And I also wanted to mention that though they're not on this slide, the University of New Hampshire provided a lot of the science for this project. So the, the goals of the project were to uh, help in four communities in New England uh, to really find a partnership between four towns and four uh, National Estuary and Research Reserve sites. And so NERS actually selected the towns. And as you can see, I'm going to switch back quickly just to this slide so you can see the towns that we worked at that was Wells, Maine, Dover, New Hampshire, Barnstable, Mass, and Cranston, Rhode Island, and the, and the uh, associated nurse sites that were close by. And what we really wanted to find out was, could we use a specific kind of engagement tool, role play simulations, to get people in these towns interested in climate adaptation? And could we depoliticize the issue a bit by really focusing on what it takes to adapt to some of the changes. And so we identified some of the key challenges and the opportunities for adaptation in each of these four places, which was different. Um, those opportunities were different and the challenges were different in each, though they were all going to experience somewhat similar climate change impacts. And then after learning about those, we wrote some role play simulations, which we'll go into a little more detail about this process in a moment. And then we got a bunch of people, over 500 total, um, among the four towns to come and play these, these role play simulations. And, it was, and what we were testing was could you actually, if you engage people in, these, uh, in this process, in these role play simulations, would they become more engaged and more interested in climate adaptation? And would that have an effect more broadly in the towns themselves 
in terms of openness to working on adaptation, um, uh, interest and willingness on behalf of the officials, uh, funding, all of those things. So we set up a pretty rigorous research process, which MIT mostly managed, um, in terms of uh, tracking changes along the way. And Steve will talk uh, quite a bit about that. So I just want to talk about four specific pieces of this project. The first was that we started the project by doing a local summary risk assessment. And you'll see on this slide that all of these reports that we'll be talking about are available at our website, which is mecap.mit.edu. So on that site, you'll find four summary risk assessments, one for each town. And basically what we're asking is, what are the local climate change risks? And what was interesting about these risk assessments is that in each place, we utilized uh, climate scientists at the University of New Hampshire to downscale the results of global models to the local areas. So even though all, these, all four of these locations are close enough that from a climate system perspective, you would expect them to experience very similar changes. Uh, using their, the local meteorological stations and doing some, some downscaling, we were actually able to give them more specific kinds of projections for their town which was a, a really interesting and ended up being a very important piece of this project. And I'm going to show you uh, an example of that in just a moment. So we did the risk assessment um, in terms of what the, what the uh, climate changes would be. But then we also did a stakeholder assessment. And this, the process for doing the stakeholder assessment um, included interviews with kind of key stakeholders in the town. And we asked them what they thought about um, adaptation efforts, what they understood about them, uh, kind of their own assessment of the level of risk in their town, their assessment of how people were viewing climate change generally and the idea of climate adaptation. So again, each of these assessments for the four towns are available on the site and you're welcome to read them, but they're very interesting in terms of elucidating what people in each of these four towns, the key stakeholders, meaning um, some of the key officials in the town, just kind of the, the uh, you know, influencers in the town, what do these people think and where and where do they stand on these issues. Uh, from those two, from those, or pardon me, let me just go on to these public opinion polls. We, we didn't want to take just what the key stakeholders told us as sort of the only way of knowing what was going on in these towns, and so we actually um, hired another company to do independent public polls, and each of these polls uh, was done in each place with about 100 people. And that gave us a sense of what the public at large thought. And we could make some comparisons between what the public felt in these towns about these issues and thought about them and, and, and uh, what some of the key stakeholders were thinking, and which produced some very interesting results, which Steve will talk a little bit about. Um, and the, the work that we did on the summary risk assessment and on the stakeholder assessment gave us the kind of data and information that we needed to write a science-based role play simulation that was tailored to that specific town. So I, for example, as a research assistant, worked on the Dover, uh, I worked with Dover in New Hampshire, and they, uh, some of their, their main concerns really came down to flooding, and they also had an interesting overlap with some history working on stormwater and stormwater management. So I wrote a game that gave people the opportunity to think about how stormwater management might be affected as climate change increases their risk of flooding. But that was not the case in Wells or in Barnstable or in Cranston. Their, their games focused on a different topic. Um, and so that was important for us to do the risk assessment and the stakeholder assessment. Otherwise, we might have written two similar, you know, four similar games for four places, but really they had very different concerns and, and very unique challenges. So we wrote these role play simulations, and each simulation had approximately um, seven, seven or eight roles. And those roles included uh, diverse representatives of different interests in the town. So things like the public works director, uh, you know, an elected official, uh, a, a local and engaged resident, environmental interests, etc. And uh, we wrote them, after doing the stakeholder and risk assessment, to try to really get a sense of what it would be like 
if seven or eight people from these towns who represented the range of interests had to sit down and really solve a problem together. And th what we gave them was the problem and the situation, and then we also gave them some science and some uh, data that they had to work with and some, some climate projections. And this is what it looked like. We gave them um, a table that kind of gave them a sense of what their town would actually could actually experience. So you can see that the categories here include temperature, precipitation, uh, et cetera, sea level rise. And as an example, what we if you let's say that you were playing the game in Dover and you were trying to figure out how to manage stormwater, you might look at what the annual maximum uh, temperature has been in the past and what it might be in the future, and you'd get a chance to kind of think through what this data means for for you. And uh, and then you could look at this sort of te temperature extreme. Now in Dover, it would be more um, relevant to look at the precipitation information, for example. But you can see that they were given this, this data and they were uh, asked to work through their decision-making process in the role play simulation by taking this uh, information and these projections into account. So um, I wanted to give everyone a quick background so you had a sense of what we had prepared and done in these towns. And then Steve is going to talk a little bit about the results in terms of what we learned through the research. And then Tana Marie will talk about what is happening now. Now that we've completed the project, we've run all the role play simulations, um, has this made any difference? And are the towns actually proceeding uh, with different kinds of activities with regard to adaptation than they would have otherwise? So I will pass it over to Steve, unless there were any clarifying questions that, they, that came in, Sarah, that you wanted to ask now. No, none right now. So okay. we'll turn it over to Steve. Yeah. Great. And Sarah, are we, are we switching over to Steve's computer? Yes, and he's picked up as presenter, so we're seeing his screen. Oh, perfect. Okay. And Steve, we're not able to hear you. Are you still muted? Um, well, while we're waiting for Steve, um, there was a question that came in. Um, Carrie, in discussing climate projections with folks in the town, how did you handle issues of uncertainty? Uh, it's a, that's a good question. So uh, when we first started in the assessments, the summary risk assessment and the stakeholder assessment, we, we used that as information for where there was uncertainty. So we would kind of uh, probe into a little bit. What, what is it that you feel uncertain about and why do you feel uncertain about it? What would make you feel more certain? Those kinds of things. So we didn't, during the stakeholder and risk assessment, phase, we really didn't try to, um, you know, disabuse anyone of their notions. We were really trying to understand how people approached it. And then during the actual um, role play simulations, what was interesting is that if people came to the table with uncertainty personally, but their role told them that they were certain, <laughs> then we asked them to play the role and try to get into the role as if they were certain. And that happened in the reverse. So in each of these four games, we had at least one, sometimes two uh, players, roles that were uncertain about the data. And they were to, regardless of what they thought personally, they were to play the role the way that it had been written so that that uncertainty could be dealt with at the table. And so, so we asked everyone to work through that because in reality, that's exactly how it is. There's always, you know, not always, but there's often someone at the table who has some uncertainty and it's really up to the other people who are trying to make a decision together to work on that and try to figure out how can we move forward even in the face of uncertainty. And hopefully if Steve actually jumps in, you might hear a little bit more about that. But that's how we dealt with it. Can, oh. can you hear me? Yes. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what happened. Um, that's all right. Well, good afternoon. And uh, thank you, Carrie, uh, for that uh, beginning. Um, so I am going to try to cover uh, some of the results uh, from these different segments. And uh, uh, I want to say that each of the components of the NECAP project produced results that in the, themselves are very important, I felt, in advancing climate adaptation efforts on the municipal level. And as a whole, they combine to effectively move the participating municipalities forward with climate adaptation. And Tana Marie, who will cover the next section, will cover uh, uh, what's going on in those communities. 
So in brief, uh, these four different main components of the NECAP project, uh, the summer risk assessment produced the local climate assessment uh, with more actionable climate risk information for each town, and that's very important. This information was directly relevant to each town and therefore a better, uh, a better decision support tool than national or regional assessments are. The stakeholder assessment uh, really began the dialogue in the town and was used to produce the customized role play, as Carrie mentioned. Um, and I thought this was really, really important that it really started the process of building trust between the research team and the municipal partners. The public polls that are really part of the evaluation process of the whole project, uh, but also uh, they were very valuable sources of social science data that was important for this project and also will be important for future projects. And the role play simulations themselves, just by having a, a high number of participants in each one, I felt that they were just great. Uh, it was basically engagement and education at its highest level. And I want to mention that there also are uh, case studies available on the uh, NECAP site. So um, I want to, I'm going to go through each of these segments a little bit in more detail. And I'm sure you know, given the time that we have today, that there's a lot of very rich data in this project that I hope you'll go to the NECAP site and, and get um, I'm, I'm, I am only going to be able to talk very briefly on each of these different segments. So again, these downscaled uh, local risk assessments were very important. Uh, they really brought the information, uh, made it relevant uh, to the town level. And here's an example of uh, some of the information that's contained in those. You'll see on these two maps on the left. Uh, Dover sea level rise map is basically land inundated in the high emission scenario long term 2085. And then there's the wells uh, data or wells graph right there to the right of it. And you can see the difference between the two towns. Uh, Dover is a municipality. It's about 10 miles inland. It's on two tidal rivers, uh, whereas wells, of course, is right on the coast of the Gulf of Maine. And they have much more severe sea level rise issues than Dover does. And as you, know, as you can see there, and also as we saw in the towns, uh, sea level rise really was not an issue of, of concern um, in Dover. On the right of this uh, slide, you'll see Dover extreme temperatures, Cranston extreme temperatures. And basically, as Carrie mentioned, we see very similar but very finesse differences in each of the four communicating uh, municipalities in terms of what the risk assessment said and uh, how it related to the towns. Now, I really appreciated the fact that um, the risk assessments often supported what the citizens were already seeing. And I thought that was really important, and it really helped the project. Um, for Barnstable, same type of conditions. Uh, they, they can expect increased temperatures, increased precipitation, more extreme precipitation events, and rising sea level. So each of the town got these uh, risk assessments. And again, very important uh, for the project and also for the towns to continue. So in Dover, uh, just a few key points about this risk assessment. Um, other than the planning staff, um, none of the interviewees really were familiar with local or regional climate projections. And this was really important for, uh, again, building the dialogue in the community. And when, when we talked about these and showed the risk assessment, it's amazing how many people really kind of connected the dots. They had seen changes themselves, but now they had a better understanding of why and how it related to them and climate change as a whole. And uh, again, stakeholders, uh, flooding, as Carrie mentioned in Dover, really was something that was a concern, something that they had been dealing with, and was reinforced again in in the risk assessment as these other impacts that they, uh, the citizens in Dover brought up, health impacts, water quality impacts, and environmental impacts were also of concern. So I'm going to jump to the stakeholder assessment. Again, as Carrie mentioned, these were face-to-face uh, -face interviews with a lot of individuals and towns. Um, these were specifically designed, and we really worked hard to get uh, all the views, the viewpoints, in the towns captured in the stakeholder assessment. We really wanted the diversity of views within each town. And in all four towns, a surprising number of people in the coastal communities are concerned. 
Uh, people are seeing and concerned about changes in weather. Uh, many are thinking about climate change and how it might affect their communities. Specifically in Dover, most if not all stakeholders had noticed a change in the weather, you know, less snow, wetter snow, hotter summers, freak storms. And they were generally concerned about these extreme storms and rising temperatures. And often uh, the participants or the interviewees didn't refer to it as climate change, but uh, and many of them were vague on what climate change actually means, yet most said they believe in climate change and are worried about it. So great information, and again, this stakeholder assessment was used to build the simulation, and um, I think also, as I mentioned before, really important that it built the dialogue. So I'm going to jump quickly here to some of the data in the, in the public polls. So this is aggregate data from all four uh, participating municipalities. One of the questions was, how concerned are you about the possible impacts of changing climate might have on your town? And you can see the spread there. And um, basically, most people are somewhat to very concerned about climate change impacts. And again, I think this public poll data is, uh, it was one of its key uses in, the, in this project was to do the evaluation of the project overall. But also, as I mentioned, uh, it's very rich with great social science data that we used in this project that helped guide us and also, I think, will help guide us in the future. Another question, do you ever think about whether a change in the climate could affect your community? There's the spread, again, aggregate between all four t uh, participating towns. And again, what we see is a lot of people are thinking about local climate change risk. Another question, how confident are you in that your town will be able to effectively respond to climate-related risk despite uncertainty about what the future climate will be like? There's the spread of the answers. And again, basically, uh, what was interesting here is that people are not very confident that their town will respond to climate-related risk. It's very interesting, and it came out again in this one here, how significant do you think climate change should or will be in your town's planning? and decision making over the next 10 years. And very interesting kind of uh, spread there, but basically people would like their town to do something, but they, they didn't really think it would occur. And I'm gonna hit upon this again in a second. Very interesting result. Uh, here's if the climate is changing, what do you think uh, should be, re or who do you think should be responsible for, for preparing for possible impacts? Again, quite a spread there in terms of uh, who they thought was responsible, but basically people assign more responsible to individuals in the federal government than they did their local government. And I want to burrow down a little bit on this, uh, uh, this feeling and this, uh, what came out in the data that people uh, thought that their towns should do something, but they didn't have a lot of faith that they would. So here's another, that same question in Dover. Um, and we saw a similar result in all four towns, but over 80% in Dover think that Dover should address it, but less than 35 think they actually will. And with the other data, it's really interesting about this, uh, basically this optimism gap. Um, and we've really been working with that a little bit and focusing on that now in our future work to try to close that optimism gap. We think it's really an important uh, result of these uh, public polls. So the role play simulations themselves uh, were a fascinating experience to go through and to observe and watch, as Kerry mentioned, and describe them uh, in each of the towns. Uh, we had over 500 from all the towns participate in these. And part of the role play simulation was at the beginning you did a pre-survey and at the end you did a post-survey as a way to try to gauge uh, what people were feeling and uh, what they were taking away from that. So here's some of the results and the findings of the, of the surveys within the role play. Uh, concern about local climate change risk increased in three of the four towns. Uh, the sense of local responsibility for preparing for and managing climate change risk increased in three of the four towns. Confidence in local adaptation action increased in all the towns. And participants' understanding of other perspectives and appreciation for the need for collective action and stakeholder engagement increased in all towns. Now I should mention in the first two there, the concern and local responsibility, three out of four, one of the towns already had a very high level of awareness. 
about climate change and had a very high concern about it. So that's the other uh, fourth town in there. And again, um, all of this data is uh, in the reports and case studies. And uh, I think it's uh, something that's valuable uh, for um, all climate practitioners. And I ended the show too quick there, but basically it's going to get back. Well, so that's the presentation I have. And now uh, Tana Marie will talk about uh, what's going on in these four towns. OK, I just switched it over to Tana Marie. OK, very good. I'm sorry I clicked that too soon. Okay, not a problem. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Tana Marie. And, and please speak as loudly as you can. OK, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tana Marie Rogers, and I'm the Coastal Training Program Coordinator at the Wakoit Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve based in Falmouth, Massachusetts. And for the third um, part of our presentation, what I'm going to try to attempt to describe in, in just a few slides is to give you a sense of um, did NECAP impact adaptation planning in any of our partner communities? And Tom Marie, have you shared your screen? We're not seeing it yet. There should be a little pop-up, or, or in your user interface, it'll, uh, you can click show a, a button, which will say show my screen. Yeah, sure. now we see it. You see it? OK. Perfect. OK. Perfect. okay. So one of the um, key project objectives was really to test um, whether or not um, participation in this project and um, playing these role play games would actually generate enough pressure to kind of stimulate local level adaptation planning and climate risk management efforts. So this was one of the key goals of the project. And while we were, all, we were testing whether or not role play could be used as an, as an effective way of engaging community members, we also wanted to get a real sense of whether or not um, this project could kind of move the needle towards helping communities advance with adaptation planning. And so one of the questions I'm going to try to just get you to see through a few stories about what the towns are doing is to get a picture of what are towns doing now as a result of NECAP, and how are they attempting to build on the project? This doesn't seem like it's allowing me to advance my slide. No, I'm I'm not seeing it advanced. Can you um are you hmm, are you able to okay, go I, back? Go ahead. I think Tom Ray, I also have your slides, so if you would just want me to advance them I can. Hold on, let me see. Okay, there we go. Can you see that? Yes, yeah, we can. Okay. Um so to answer that question, um, you would think that at, there are a couple places that we could um, identify where th is there evidence of change happening at the local level. And some of the places we could look to see that change is, is really um, starting to occur is, you know, we could take a look at land use planning, um, infrastructure planning, um, other long-term planning activities that the town is engaged in and key planning documents that municipalities generate to operate by and see if there is evidence there. Um, are there things like are any of these communities attempting to generate um, comprehensive adaptation plans? Are they looking at environmental regulations to see where there might be changes to accommodate um, adaptation options? Um, how are they thinking about stakeholder engagement differently or you know, now as a result of the project as it relates to planning for climate change into the future? Are new par partnerships developing, relationships being built to address this fundamental question? Um, are, are any of the communities um, looking at how they dedicate their resources? And um, are they looking at public education with a new kind of focus on this climate, climate um, risk management um, area? And can we see evidence of collective action and awareness? And lastly, do we see um, impact in the area of decision making? Are any of the communities now starting to to incorporate climate change into their everyday decision making, decisions that would relate to any kind of development actions, funding, planning. So these are some of the areas that we try to kind of just do a quick assessment to see, do we see any of that taking place now in our four partner communities? 
And so what I'm going to try to do really quickly is to step through the four towns that participated and, and try to tell a story of what they're doing now and give you a sense in their own words how they view the project. And so let's start out with Barnstable. In Barnstable, um, what, one thing that was really evident is that the, the community was really ripe for, a, for, for, for climate change was an issue that was ripe for attention in the public's eye. And interestingly enough, um, when our reserve approached Barnstable to participate in this project, one of the things that they, the, the planners there were interested in knowing is, is the community ready to do this? Or are we going to try to, to move forward adaptation planning with a community that, that is reticent to the idea and, and just end up struggling with it? And so this is one of the questions they had going in, and they really thought that the community was not ready to proceed. Um, so finding out that, that, that they really were and that the issue was so ripe for attention was a really big lesson. Um, second, in Barnstable, um, they really had a focus uh, on climate mitigation going into this. A lot was happening on that front. But NECAP helped to kind of elevate the importance of adaptation planning and that it really needed to be both sides of the coin that would be addressed. Um, the town, um, of its own accord, kind of went ahead and developed a, a, a video to kind of to showcase to the public what they were doing on the mitigation side and what they were trying to do on the adaptation side and how they were folding in media involvement, working with um, the arts and culture um, organizations in, in the town to really ramp up um, attention on this topic. And so that was a very interesting way that the town has been going about it, especially with trying to embrace this issue and bring it into the into the into the work of the arts and culture community. They're now actively seeking funding for adaptation planning where that was not happening before. They're trying to seek grants to move forward with risk and vulnerability assessments in their town. They haven't gotten those yet, but they're really actively seeking that. And so there's a clear momentum shift in interest that has happened in Barnstable on this topic. It, I was there at the beginning working with this town and and at the end of this project, and so. Being one of those persons that has been involved in, in, in Barnstable in particular, I can clearly say that that has happened over, over this two-year cycle of the project. And there also one other specific thing that the town is doing is that they're now pursuing participation in FEMA's um, community rating system program, which, as you might know, is a program that really encourages communities to think about floodplain management and to deal with their risks to different hazards. Let's move over to Cranston, Rhode Island. One of the a couple things happening happening there. In in Cranston, they have now used a climate risk assessment document that both Steve and Carrie talked about, that downscale climate information for their for their municipality. And they've used that and infused it into their hazard mitigation plan that FEMA requires for communities to do. And one interesting thing that the planner there pointed out is that, you know, when you're doing a hazard mitigation plan in communities, FEMA typically has a list of hazards that it wants the communities to kind of step through and think about what their level of vulnerability is, how they would plan for it. And in this case, um, based on the climate risk assessment from NECAP, what they've opted to do in developing their HMP is to really focus on riverine flooding because that came out so, so powerful in the climate risk assessment that they did. So it's kind of showing a shift in focus and making their hazard mitigation planning much more focused, and they feel they have a much better plan because of it. Um, they now have plans to incorporate NECAP into the town's comprehensive plan that they're beginning to work on now. Like Downsipple, they too are pursuing becoming a CRS community. And it's interesting because many communities in the New England area were not um, participants in the CRS program, even though that is, that is a program that has been around for a long time. And you will see um, when I get through the list of the communities and what they're doing that three of or four partner communities are now actively actually pursuing becoming CRS um, designated communities. Um, in Cranston, they're also really, and this is more anecdotal, but it's kind of showing how the, uh, how the trickle down effect from this project and how it's starting to percolate into different areas, that they're looking at wastewater infrastructure and, and realizing that some of their pumping stations and things like that, based on the climate risk assessment, would be quite vulnerable to flooding. And so they're considering these risks and really starting to open up conversation about what their management options would be. Um, they're also looking at um, inter another interesting story is that things like talking about stormwater utilities as a management option was kind of a very strange area of conversation before with public works and planning. And now because of this project, 
it's kind of opened up that dialogue again, and it can be put on the table for consideration. And Cranston, uh, lastly, is one of the only, uh, I think, one of only two communities in New England that is actively now looking at a buyout program for repetitive lost properties. Going on to no Dover, New Hampshire, a few things to point out here in Dover. They, too, like Cranston and Barnstable, are looking at becoming a CRS community. They're planning to incorporate NECAP findings into the, the town's, um, the land use chapter of the town's master plan. And um, Dover now sits on the steering committee um, for the Resilient New Hampshire Coast Project. They're actively involved in, in, in leading and helping to plan public outreach workshops um, that are dealing with climate change education. And so they've really started taking a leadership role in their area in, you know, when it comes to educating the public and engaging the public on climate change issues, it's starting to see that kind of emerge. In Wells, um, this project has definitely helped to increase attention on climate adaptation planning. And one of the, the areas that this was evident was in staff participation just in the final workshop to present the findings. I understand that almost all staff were there. And at the beginning of the project, it was, it was, um, there was a lot of doubt whether or not the reserve could even get help wells to participate in this project. So clear, a clear shift in participation and momentum. They're also writing their comprehensive plan, and like some of the other communities I mentioned before, looking to incorporate information from the climate risk assessment. They have seen some strengthening, strengthened partnerships, for example, for example, with the Southern Regional Planning Commission that's now working with the town on their beach management plan, looking at erosion issues. Um, and they've done a, another small anecdote here that they've started looking and planning for storm impacts, considering events like Sandy that in, impacted communities in New Jersey and New York, and thinking about issues like trash. If that were to happen in their communities, where would they, how would they deal with an impact like that that other communities, Sandy affected communities, had seen? And so they're starting to think ahead for how to make provisions for these sorts of things. And so I want to just give you a few quotes. I think it's important because we don't have any of our town partners here on the, uh, on the call, just to have people kind of hear in their own words. That speaks volumes to me. And I, and I think it's very evident just to kind of see what, they, what their thoughts are. So I'm going to read a few of these quotes to you because I think they're powerful. In Barnstable, um, the town planner there has mentioned that NECAP allowed the discussion to proceed in a meaningful way by not just focusing on the acceptance of the science, but rather on the climate change impacts to the town. And another quote from Barnstable, that they were skeptical about using role play. They did not think folks would seriously participate, but the project helped them to learn that that was not the case and that the role play was a great engagement tool. In Cranston, an interesting um, comment was that one of the most helpful aspects of the project was getting veteran city staff members outside of their comfort zone seriously discussing climate adaptation as a normal part of their duty. Climate change adaptation and resiliency planning is not something they would actively pursue. So seeing this happening on different fronts now is encouraging. I do not feel that we would be making progress in this area without the project at this stage. In Dover, um, the comment was made that city employees and city council members are bringing up the topic of sea level rise uh, more routinely on a regular basis than ever happened before this project took place. And then in Wells, um, some of the quotes we, we heard were, I gained an awareness that more people are concerned about climate adaptation than I thought. And I think that this is a very powerful point, because sometimes the perspective we have about where the public is at at an issue can definitely um, dominate how we, how we choose to proceed on it and what we choose to do. And NECAP has kind of um, exposed that sometimes where the public is at and where local officials might think they're at are very different places. And, and, and in the case of several of our communities, it was clear that the community was much more concerned about climate change than local officials might have um, thought going in. And an interesting um, observation was made um, by planners in Wells, where they kind of did a comparison, contrasted kind of the FEMA flood maps that were out there and with the kneecap. And um, the comment was, there is doubt around FEMA. Folks are not sure if they trust government to tell them the impacts of climate change, even if they see it in storm after storm. But this process was transparent and open in comparison to the FEMA one. 
it has more legitimacy, and those who participated understand it. Now, we're not trying to say that NECAP is better than the FEMA process or anything like that, but it's just to, um, to highlight how people have received the project and that they feel a part of the process. And so earlier on when I started talking, I showed you a list of where, where could we look for evidence of change in terms of answering this question of whether or not NECAP has really helped to move the needle on adaptation planning in the communities. And so I'm going to go back to that list and I've put a red asterisk on um, every area just from the, the brief stories that I've showed you in terms of where we've seen movement and action on that now in the communities. We've definitely seen areas in land use planning and infrastructure planning, long-term planning activities, a lot of the planning documents. We heard about comprehensive plans, master plans, hazard mitigation plans um, being addressed and, and the climate risk assessment being incorporated into those documents. We've heard stories of new partnerships and relationships being built. Um, we've definitely seen um, an interest in, in local officials understanding the need to really engage, engage the community. And not just the need to engage the community, but that, the, that community members want to be engaged in the process. So that is a learning that has happened, and there's an interest in continuing that, that engagement over time. Um, there's small, small, small um, evidence of, of where people are thinking about dedicating resources, and by resources could be funding for a project or just dedicating staff time to work on this. We all know municipal staff are pressed for time, so dedicating, putting this as a, as a priority is a really big shift. Um, public education has become, uh, and the need for more of that is getting attention, and that there's definitely growth in collective action and awareness on the topic. And I just want to end with this one slide, which is just uh, my own closing reflection on, on NECAP, to say that I think that in all, while our communities were all at different places, all at different starting points, they faced some similar risks from, the, from, from what the climate risk assessment exposed. They're going about things differently. They're all kind of starting out with this process. But a couple things were similar. And if you look at this kind of pie chart with a wheel of different things, I just want to point out that what NECAP helped to do was to really, I'm going to start with the, the slice of the pie that says kind of local education, um, that red slice, and kind of work my way around. Um, the project helped to do that through the role play games. Um, it helped to highlight the risk that the community was facing, so it made it very locally relevant. It also did something that we've heard our communities ask for a lot. Can you make climate change real to us by helping us understand what are the local impacts we are likely to see? Because that's what we need to know to really advance our planning efforts. And NECAP helped to do that. It engaged local stakeholders. It actually, I think, is helping to create local champions by the people that we've worked with. And any issue like climate change, which requires so much, so much effort from the community and so much buy-in and a long-term investment, it's important to have local champions. It exposed that local action and responsibility was needed, it was necessary, and, and um, that it wasn't just kind of waving your hands and waiting for something to happen. It generated momentum, it created local resources like these risk assessments and things that people could dig into and understand where their community was at. It definitely served as a catalyst for conversation, and it actually helped people to think through, okay, but we were now going to think about adaptation planning what were some of the options that we could consider for our particular community? And it started these partnerships, a partnership that is exemplified in, in, in the partners that are working on this project, but it's spilling over in many different areas. And so I think that for me, the lesson here is that all adaptation is local. And so if we're trying to answer the question, did NECAP help to move communities toward that? If you see many places on this wheel, there's local, 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 local. And it needs to happen at that level. And this project definitely helped to create a foundation in my estimation. And I think that's been supported by the comments we've heard from our town planning partners that the foundation has been created. There's fertile ground on which to continue this. NACAP was only a two a two year project, but in that two years, I think a lot has been accomplished. They're definitely just at um, some baby steps have been taken, some some progression has been seen, but there's a lot of work to be done. But that that, that fertile ground has been created for movement. And so with that, I'd like to wrap up 
and just say, um, as my colleagues have mentioned, you can get where you can find the reports on the website and how you can, can contact us. So thank you for your time. And with that, we'll take any questions. Sarah? Hello? Oh, okay, sorry, I think we lost Sarah. Um, I'm just going to take over here with questions then. Um, hopefully Sarah can come back on soon. Okay, so we do have a few questions, uh, one of which is, is discussing climate projections with folks in the town. Uh, how did you handle issues of uncertainty in climate projections? I believe we, that question was already asked and addressed. Oh, right, she did that. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't mark that off on my list. Uh, what level of funding did you need to accomplish this project per town? Uh, I, this is Carrie. We, uh, the project overall was about a 600, the, the overall budget was 600,000 for the full uh, two years, and that included everything that we've discussed. And I, I want to pitch in just a little bit here on that question because uh, one of the things that I loved about this project was that I really felt uh, it was really well balanced, meaning that each of the different components of the project was resourced and funded properly. Uh, oftentimes the engagement or other parts of a project will be, uh, you know, uh, not get the resources that it really needs. And I thought this project was really well designed really well resourced, and I think the results uh, are, are a consequence of that. Excellent. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, oh, can you give an update on uh, the FEMA CRS program in Maine? Well, we don't have anyone uh, from Maine on the call, actually. Um, so uh, that would have been uh, Chris Ford, the CTP coordinator up at the Wells Reserve, perhaps could answer that. But unfortunately, she's not on the call. OK, duly noted. Uh, so Tana and Marie said that there were only two communities in New England that are working on uh, buoyant programs for repetitive lost properties. Um, what other towns did you have in mind for that? Um, I don't, um, I personally don't have any other towns in mind for that. I know that there, there, there are many towns that might have areas in their community where they see um, that they have repetitive lost properties, and, and that's a struggle for them to address how to deal with that over, over time. I can't quite put a number on that, but it's just to say that I think that it's a bold, in my estimation, a bold, a bold um, kind of approach that Cranston is kind of looking at that very squarely. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so going to back to the question about uncertainty, um, see, I think the person that might have meant uncertainty in projections about what the future climate will be rather than uncertainty about climate change on part of the program participants. Um, so do you guys have anything to say about um, uncertainty and climate projection models and conveying that to the participants? Well, um, yeah. so let me try to I'll, I'll jump in real quick here. Um, the risk assessments uh, were done by uh, scientists and climatologists from UNH, and, and uncertainty, uncertainty was part of those risk assessments and was discussed in each one. Um, I, I had heard some uh, um, outside of this project, um, some criticisms of trying to downscale the information, and I, I think it's incredibly valuable, even though there's that uncertainty in there, and we know that uh, the the science behind creating these risk assessments and under you know uh, changing the models, they'll only get better as time goes on, and therefore the data will change. But I think having that locally relevant information was absolutely critical, making it real to each of the each of the towns. I think they understood that there was uncertainty as to what was being said, but to have it actually be focused on the on the municipal level. Um, uh, just made it uh, work so well, even with the uncertainty in there, and the uncertainty was discussed when we brought those risk uh, assessment forwards to each each town. And this is Tana Marie. I would just want to add to what Steve said to, to mention that what I observed in Barnstable, which is the community I worked with the most, is that the uncertainty issue didn't crop up as much when you're talking through the lens of the climate risk assessment because it was made so locally relevant. 
Uh, and, and just in reflecting on it now, as you mentioned the question, my sense is that maybe people felt that it was, it, it was not talking about like, okay, these are the projections for New England as a whole, or these are the, the projections for, it, it's not, it wasn't at the global or the regional scale, it was local, and so it made it, it made it more tangible somehow. It doesn't mean that the question of uncertainty went away, as, as Steve mentioned, that that was hit upon. Um, in a couple of our workshops, we did have um, climate, um, I don't like to use labels, but climate skeptics who would be in the, it, it, who played some of our games or who at least um, came to the workshops and they, they did offer um, their reservations about the process. Um, not many people, but I think I was happy to see that people like that turned out because it meant that um, they cared, they wanted to see what the process was like and they were offering a perspective that that needed to be on the table, you know, in terms of understanding where different parts of the community was at. But I think that when they raised their questions, it was more about broader issue of consensus on climate change in general, not so much the actual risk assessment data. So a real quick follow-up on that, which I think okay. is really interesting here. Uh, oh, sorry, did you want to finish? No, uh, I'm sorry, this is Carrie. I this this may be you may get here in your in your. Okay. Follow up, but I think kind of how did the scientists themselves uh, give us, you know, in uh, Carrie, you're breaking up a little bit there. In, in relaying the information, did they share their level of certainty? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, oh, now you're coming through is again. Is that any is that any better at all? Yeah, yeah, that's better. No, give give me one. Oh. Okay, give me one second. I'm just going to quick switch a little okay. better. Um, Basically, the the scientists themselves, and I just want to, if you, Nick, can you show my screen or could only Sarah do that? Uh, yeah, here I can switch over to you. Okay, there we go. It should be on to you now. Um, I you just, just want to show folks this data um, slash I think you have to okay. click in the, in the top corner. There should be a share my screen button now. Okay. And then go to webinar control panel. There it is. Okay. Okay. Is it? Uh, it's not showing up yet. It's there now. It says on air, showing screen. Uh, it might just take a couple seconds to come through here. Um, okay. Let me see if there's another way to force it through. Huh, it says it's still waiting to view your screen on my dashboard. Um, on my end, it says on air showing screen. Huh, you might just want to, let me just try switching the uh, presenter. Let, let me quickly. talk through it and, and right. maybe the... Oh, now it's coming through. Okay, great. So just to, um, what I wanted to share with people is that the, the climate science Scientists at, at UNH who gave us this information tried to share uh, with us, and then we tried to share with the people that we, uh, you know, worked with, that there is some uncertainty in these numbers. And one thing that we tried to do was to to share with them the t t medium term and long term. And if you can see here, these three those three columns: short term without 69 and long. Long term, and we and we told them as we shared people who with people, especially people who who had questions about this, that the precision was reduced the farther out we went in those time horizons. So we we shared with people that that the state of the science now is that we feel more sure about what we can predict in the near future. Talk with people about that. We also showed uh, low a low emissions scenario. Oh, and a high emission scenario, which did give us an opportunity to talk with people about the implication of policy. Excellent, thank you. What, what's that, Nick? Oh, sorry, uh, thank you for that. Um, so just a real quick definition question uh, here. Um, what, would, okay. what did you guys mean by stormwater utilities? That's when um, people would, this is how we this is when people would pay. Uh, that, 
I'm sorry, Tana, Marie, did you want to continue that? Yeah, people would pay a fee, you know, um, for, for stormwater control their town would be doing. But sometimes there is pushback on that because almost it's viewed as a tax and not something that would be done for, you know, protecting the resource or protecting the community. So that's typically a lot of education needs to happen around that, but it would be kind of using, having people pay for the service to help the town put in stormwater management um, uh, infrastructure or different things like that. Excellent. Thank you. Can I add to that a little? Yeah. Well, in New Hampshire, uh, um, almost uh, most of the communities here in New Hampshire uh, deal with and pay for stormwater management uh, just through their general funds. And it's a, it's a real problem because uh, citizens don't see that as part of their, their tax bill. And um, so they don't, they don't identify the funds that actually go to that, and the, and the towns tend to uh, grab any uh, five dollars here and ten dollars there to deal with stormwater. So um, we've had several towns here in New Hampshire look at uh, uh, creating a stormwater utility for dedicated funds to deal with stormwater, and it, I think it's a viable tool. But but uh, it, it it does get identified as a rain tax, which uh, drives people absolutely crazy. <laughs> Uh, you gotta love taxes and how people react to those. <laughs> uh, so we have time for one more question, it looks like, on my clock. Um, and here's a really good one, I think. Um, can you give more information on the content of the before and after surveys that you gave to the uh, role play participants? Uh, for example, what type of questions you use? How did you test their increased knowledge? Things along those lines. Carrie's probably the best person to answer that. And uh, But I will say that all of those materials are on the kneecap a website again, and they have the surveys and all the materials are there. Excellent. Thank you. And just a note, we will be sure to email that out to everybody um, after the webinar. Uh, Carrie, did you want to follow up then on those materials? Yep. And this is Carrie. I'll ask, I will answer. Sure. Let me just answer generally that we would ask people, for example, simple things like, um, you know, do you under, what do you understand? Uh, to uh, what is what do the what does the phrase climate adaptation mean for example can you hear me uh, yeah you came back in now again uh, and we would ask uh, do you think that uh, respond okay we would ask do you think that responding to climate change is a local response etc so we kind of got a sense of what people um, who who people uh. Yeah, Carrie, we seem to be losing to work you. on this problem. It's coming in and out um, and it's up and down. Kinds of things. So we have... <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, Carrie, I'm going to go ahead and mute you because you're not really coming through correctly at all. I think that everything's coming back like 15 seconds late. Um, so with that, it is the hour. So I think you guys should be free to go and we should stop forcing you to answer all our questions. Um, but uh, so this webinar has been recorded and we'll uh, put this up. I'll get it online in about a half hour here. And uh, Sarah will be sure to email you all uh, the link to the webinar recording and the link to the materials that we were just talking about that are all online with the full array of questions and answers and survey questions. Um, so thank you all so much for doing this webinar with us. Nick, actually. Oh, hi. Hi, Sarah. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Um, I don't typically send out the recording to everyone unless they ask. So Just if you kidding. do want the recording, please send me an email and I'll send it to you individually. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you so much for moderating, Nick. <laughs> yep, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm okay. just forcing you to do more work. Um, All right, but yeah, yeah anyway. So, uh, uh, in terms of... Oh, sorry, God. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say thank you for moderating, Nick, and, and, and thank you, everyone. Sorry, I disappeared. Um, GoToWebinar just did an update yesterday, and I think they may still be working out some of the uh, kinks for the system, so uh, I, I anticipate we won't run into quite this many problems in the future with the audio. Fingers uh, crossed. Anyway, yeah, exactly. Um, thank you so much to... Uh, Carrie and, and Steve and Tana Marie, uh, we really enjoyed learning about the project. And again, if you do want a copy of the recording, please just shoot me, Sarah, or an email, and I'll send it to you. OK. Uh, and have a great uh, afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. OK. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.